Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Our message today is... Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Amen. Please listen once again to these two verses from Zechariah chapter 9, which will serve as our meditation this morning. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Here is God's word for us today. Dear servants of our Savior and King, every spring in Jerusalem, crowds of people would head to the city for this big celebration of the Passover. It was one of the highest points of their year. And everyone was supposed to go to the great city of Jerusalem to celebrate. Imagine what that trip was like for them, especially those last few steps that they passed with Jesus on that Palm Sunday day. Perhaps those of you who live up in the ridges can maybe appreciate it a little bit better, but as they they come over that last ridge, the Mount of Olives that was mentioned in our gospel lesson, as they come up over past Bethany and Bethphage, There, across the valley in front of them and on the the following ridge across that Kidron Valley was the beautiful city of Jerusalem. And on that eastern side of Jerusalem as they walked towards it was, was this beautiful wall and on top of that wall was the gorgeous temple of the Lord, their destination. And undoubtedly, those last few steps across the Kidron Valley and up into the city of Jerusalem were the most joyful ones of their trip. Not only were they near their destination, not only was their journey about to come to an end, but the purpose for which they had traveled so far was standing there staring them in the face. And as those Jewish people would make those final steps up into Jerusalem, they would often sing psalms, many of those psalms of ascent we have recorded for us in the book of Psalms. But on that special day, they sang a psalm in particular. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The hills around Jerusalem were ringing with their shouts of joy and praise to God. They waved palm branches and placed their cloaks on the road in front of this prophet from Nazareth riding on a donkey. In our gospel lesson this morning, Matthew made it clear that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was the fulfillment of prophecy from the Old Testament. He said it would happen exactly this way. Zechariah had prophesied that he would come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. But as we read the rest of the prophecy, it's very clear that the people who were there singing praises to Jesus were also fulfilling this prophecy from Zechariah. They shout in praise to God in the highest when they see their Savior coming. Zechariah's prophecy is not just for the people of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. His prophecy is for us today too, all the servants of the Lord. He tells us all that when we see our Savior coming and when we look ahead to his coming again, we are to rejoice and shout in praise to God, glorifying the King of Kings. But this prophet from Nazareth in Galilee sure doesn't look much like a King of Kings. I mean, after all, he's riding on a donkey. <laughs> it's not a, a war horse or, or some powerful steed. There's no great army with him. He doesn't have scores of servants to attend to his every need. I mean, the people that are following him, the ones that came from Galilee, were a couple of fishermen, a tax collector, some women who very generously took care of Jesus' needs. 
And the people who were there in the crowd around him singing his praises, they weren't the religious elite. They weren't the, the well-known and the famous in the city of Jerusalem. They were peasants. They were religious pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem for the festival. There really isn't anything that's all that glorious and exalted about this procession going into Jerusalem except for these wonderful words that they sing. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And these words speak volumes. They tell us so much. Sure, it's quite likely that many of the people who were there singing these words of praise to God did not understand the full meaning of what they were saying, much like you and I can probably pray the words of the Lord's Prayer and sing some of these hymns that we sing without really thinking about what we're saying or praying for either. But these words the crowd shouted and sang gave thanks to God for sending us his promised salvation. They called Jesus the son of David, the one that the Almighty God had promised to King David way back in the Old Testament, that he would have a son, that God would raise up for him a son who would sit on his throne and rule over God's kingdom and extend its, its borders to the ends of the earth and who would reign on that throne forever and ever. Sure, Solomon was a pretty good king for much of his life and reigned in a, in a great and glorious way, but he did not reign forever. He was not the fulfillment of God's promise to Solomon. Israel knew that there was one more king descended from David's line who was going to come and reign over God's people and establish his throne forever and ever. God promised David in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you and I will establish his kingdom. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. Nothing that anyone could do or would do would stop that from happening because God had promised it. He himself was coming to establish this king. And he says so in our lesson from Zechariah 9 too. He says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and his rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. The people were right to give praise to God with such exalted words even though likely none of them fully understood the meaning of what they were saying. God's plan of salvation was happening in Jerusalem. He was keeping his promises, and God himself was coming to save his people. Jesus' glory, though, there on that Palm Sunday day was very much covered in humility. The prophet who was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, though, was the almighty Son of God. And Paul tells us that in this very humble-looking man, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. God had masked his power for a time, covered it up in humility, and rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. That's what our, our second lesson today was saying as well. That before Jesus came to this earth, he had all glory and power and majesty at the right hand of God, sitting at his Father's throne in heaven, and yet he was willing to give it all up and come in appearance as a man, humbling himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. For a time, he was humble and lowly. He looked like he was even powerless to help himself. But don't you be fooled. Don't be fooled by the show of humility and weakness as we follow our Savior to the cross. Remember, this is how God works. And not just with his son, but so often in the Bible, God takes those things that are weak and that look weak and that are very clearly weak and God makes them strong with his own strength. Take King David, for example. A humble shepherd boy, the youngest of his brothers. Not the most impressive. His brothers were, were tall and strong and handsome. But God took David from among the flock, from among the sheep, and made him into the greatest king that Israel had known to this point. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he boasts about his weakness. 
And God seems even intent on keeping Paul weak and displaying his weakness to other people, giving him this physical ailment that the Apostle Paul only refers to as a thorn in his flesh. And when he asks God to take it away, God simply says, no, because my power is made perfect in your weakness. Again and again throughout the Bible, God does this to his people. And the people in Zechariah's day, you could say the same thing for them. They were disheartened by the the small number of people that had returned from captivity in Babylon. There they were trying to rebuild the temple, but what was once Solomon's gorgeous temple, one of the seven great wonders of the ancient world, now what was in its place, what they were able to build, what they had the resources to put together was a far cry from what Solomon had given to them. But God told the people not to despise the days of small things. God guaranteed their success, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. God's victory over his enemies would not come by military might or political power or influence, but but by his spirit. It's in that spirit that we put our trust too. When we go out with the sweet message of Jesus, our coming Savior, and share that good news with others, it's not your superior intellect or your superior understanding of God's word or some some great and fancy logical reasoning process that you have to, to convince someone else that Jesus is the Savior of the world and that he took their sins away. It's God's Holy Spirit. You don't have to wait for the timing to be just perfect and just right. God commands us to share his powerful word and promises that his spirit and his power goes out with that word to bring people to faith, to strengthen faith, and to build us up when we are low and brought down in our sin. It's all too tempting, though, for us to focus on the seeming weakness of our Savior and the seeming weakness of His Word. But this week, as we follow our Savior through that upper room on Monday, Thursday, His betrayal in the garden, His trial, and His crucifixion on Good Friday, let us not lose sight of His glory and His power. We'll remember how he was captured and beaten, flogged and hung up there on the cross to die. We'll see his lifeless body taken down by friends who mourned his death. But don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by the humility. Don't think for a second that he was ever losing. He went to that cross on purpose. He suffered and died to free us from our sins and to win for us forgiveness. He won for us righteousness and salvation even when he seemed weak and helpless. His death was our victory. He rescued and saved us. He accomplished everything that he came to do when he looked the most beaten. Jesus wasn't the loser of Holy Week. He's the winner of God's entire plan of salvation for all eternity. He comes as our victorious king, Zechariah tells us in these verses. He crushed the devil there in Jerusalem and destroyed his power forever. Sure, the devil is still around and he can still trip us up and cause us to fall. The devil had, at one time though, had power over the entire human race since Adam and Eve had fallen into sin. But because Jesus suffered the punishment for that sin that Adam and Eve had brought into the world, you and I are released from the devil's grasp. He, he cannot drag us down under punishment for our sins in hell Jesus has taken away your sins and even given you the power with his word to defend yourself from the devil's evil attacks. Knowing that your enemy is too broken to ever rise again gives us the encouragement that we need to continue fighting even when we fail and fall down in our sin. The devil cannot overpower us. He does not have the upper hand any longer. As Luther said, he can harm us none. He's judged. The deed is done. No matter what evil the devil tries to send your way, whether it's the loss of a loved one, loss of a job, family hardships, sickness, whatever it is you might be facing, 
The devil cannot overpower you. He cannot take away your faith, even if he takes away everything else. Goods, fame, child, and wife, Luther says. You still have not lost any, anything because God won the victory for you and gave you eternal life through Jesus' sacrifice for you on the cross. The reason Jesus gave up his heavenly glory and came to this earth humbly, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, was because he came for us. He came to be one of us, to live perfectly under the law like we were supposed to do. He came humbly as a human being so that God could punish sin in a human being and the rest of us could go scot-free. He could have come in power. Just think about that. He could have come riding into Jerusalem on a chariot of fire and just absolutely slashed and destroyed everyone who sinned against him. But that would mean that every single one of us here would be lost. It was for you and for me. And because of you and me and because of our sin that Jesus came not with might or power but in peace and humility. In those days a king might come riding into his city like Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Perhaps after a great military victory the king and his soldiers would come riding in uh, scattering the, the spoils of war that they had won, gifts of peace to celebrate the, the peace that that king had established by his military victory. M much the same way that maybe firefighters toss, toss candy to the children during a parade during the summer. The king shared those spoils of war, the fruits of their victory, and tokens of their favor to celebrate the peace that was won. But the gifts that Jesus gives us are so much greater than any candies and trinkets handed out at parades greater than any gifts or spoils of war that a king would toss out to the peasants and share with his people. Jesus' gifts show his glory as the Son of God, and he hands to us the spoils of peace from his victory over sin and death. He gives us righteousness and salvation, gifts beyond value that will bless us for all eternity and demonstrate his love for us. And for those gifts, we can't help but thank and praise him. Zechariah encourages us to shout, shout out God's praise, the same way the people did who walked there with Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. And you and I do here today, singing these joyful hymns. And when we speak and sing and shout praise to God and pray to him, these things please God and fill us with joy at Jesus coming at the same time. You know, I heard about a, a high school recently that was, they're having some trouble at their basketball games because not just the players, but the, the fans in the stands were being very rude and, and saying crude things to the refs and to the opposing players. So the school board decided that they were going to have a silent game where no one was allowed to say anything. They could wave their hands but that was all the noise that the crowd was allowed to make. Otherwise, it had to be completely quiet in there. Can you imagine what, how that would have kind of sucked the life out of a game? I would even have a hard time playing when you make a big basket and there's no noise whatsoever, just people waving their hands. When we're excited, we want to shout. We want to use our voices. We want to make noise. God has given you a voice to praise him to make your joyful noise to him, to clap your hands and sing songs of joy and praise him for all he's done for you. And he even gives you a target with your voice and where you would give his praise. God, he says in our lesson that God's goal is to proclaim peace to the nations. The people who need to hear about the peace that Jesus has won for you are here and out there and all around the world. Let them hear what God has done for you. Praise the Lord with your voice. And often we can praise our Lord even louder with our actions than just with our words. As we think about our Savior's coming this week, let's remember that he promised also to come again. And there will be some similarities between his coming 
into Jerusalem and his coming on the last day. But on that last day, we will see him coming on the clouds of heaven. And yes, we will sing his praises and glorify him as we see him coming and and taking us to be with him forever in heaven. But as we wait for that day, and as we see the signs of Jesus' second coming, coming soon, he tells us again and again in his word to live righteous lives full of love and peace toward others and obedience to God's commands. As we read through the New Testament, especially the the apostles' letters again and again, we hear them talking about that last day, and, and as they point to that last day, they say, what should you be doing as you look forward to Jesus coming, as you praise him for, for keeping his promise to come back and take you to be with him? We should live glorifying God for what he has done. Take Second Peter chapter 3, for example. He says, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. Our joy that he came to us in peace as our suffering Savior, combined with our joy of anticipating his coming again in power on the last day, cause us to rejoice and praise God and live holy and godly lives at peace with others in thanks to our King. So let us keep our eyes focused on that day of Jesus coming again. And as we see our Savior coming, shout in praise for the one who has come to save us just as the people of Jerusalem did. Not just one day of our lives, but every day of our lives. And then when we see him, we will go to be with him in perfect happiness and holiness to praise his name and thank him forever. Amen. Please stand. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Join us for worship at the following times, like us on Facebook, or visit our website for audio and video sermons or to find out more about our congregation. God bless your week in the Lord.